Is that sharing All right. okay? Well, yes, we can see. All right, thank you. Welcome to our session. Um, well, hello, GitOps community. Welcome to our session on From the Wild West, the Flux Multi-Tenancy. All right, next slide, please. Let's first establish State Farm's Kubernetes footprint. Okay. Whenever we say a large multi-tenant cluster or fleet of clusters, what we mean is 750 plus namespaces in test and around 250 plus namespaces in prod, and that is for data center. So it is, it is pretty significant, right? Um, just to finish up all of our Kubernetes footprint, we do have EKS clusters out in AWS that's hovering around 10, and those are all sing single tenant clusters. For the rest of our talk, though, we will be focusing on our large multi-tenant on-prem Kubernetes clusters. Next slide. So January of 2019 is when GitOps is generally available here at State Farm. What that means is if you are deploying our Kubernetes cluster, this is the workflow that you would adopt. I'm gonna highlight the bits and pieces that make up the GitOps solution. Number one is the GitOps CLI. It's what bridges the communication between the source repo over to your config repo, right? It's what's moving over pertinent environment configuration files over to your config repo, which is the blue box here. It is stood up through automation thanks to Terraform and reinforced again through automation via Terraform, okay? It's once you move, right? Once you move the pertinent YAML files that describes your target state, as soon as that gets approved by the corresponding manager and applied to master, you can expect that Flux will do its thing. And that is to realize however you describe your target state into your Kubernetes namespace. And just to finish up this config repo, we also have a webhook pre-configured in every single one of these config repos to um, update our asset inventory whenever a production deployment happens in any given product or application. So GitOps back in 2019 is in the house, right? And that's primarily for application deployments. Next slide. There we go. In the spirit of continuous improvement, we then took a step back. Let's, let's do a retrospective. What can we do better? What are the things that we can improve upon? So these are, uh, for lack of a better term, these are the areas for improvement, right? Number one is enforcement and governance. How do we make sure that the right behaviors are truly what's being practiced and adopted by our GitOps community at State Farm? The bottom line, how do we make sure that Flux and only Flux can realize changes onto your target namespace? And when I say Flux, I'm interchangeably referring to Flux and Flux Home Operator. Next, next area for improvement, there's still a little bit of imperative approaches as we interface with our Kubernetes cluster here at State Farm. Um, what I mean by that is I, myself, or my, my team, we are one of the tenants. And if I ever need to make a change into my namespace, the very first thing that I play with, handed to me by our Kubernetes admin team, I have to interface with the admin team to get, let's say, a limit range updated for me. And what the human operator would do is to go into the cluster and edit my namespace via kubectl. And so long story short, that is a red flag, right? We all know that. Last and certainly not the least, we needed clear definition on what stands up Flux. And when I say Flux, there's varying Flux instances, right? There's Flux per namespace, there's Flux at the cluster level. It's that we needed clear guidance on who's responsible for each of these flux instances. Also, after our initial GitOps rollout, we got this question quite a bit. How, I am a consumer, how do I bring in additional config repos, which would mean I would need to tie that to additional flux instances. Because we know flux one, it's a one-to-one -one mapping, one config repo, one flux instance. Those are the areas that we needed to improve on. Next. The answer, flux multi-tenancy. First order of business is education. I can't tell you enough <laughs> how many times I watched Stefan Pradhan's um, 2019 KubeCon presentation on flux multi-tenancy. I watch it over and over. And then since we sit behind a corporate firewall, we brought in the flux multi-tenancy GitHub repository within our walls and the necessary Docker images from out in the public registry. 
Through our partnership with our Kubernetes admin team, they provided a sandbox cluster for us to be able to play around with Flux multi-tenancy. So that was our focus as us as the GitOps team. Once we have enough experience and knowledge and really saw the potential, we knew it was time to pitch it, right? We pitched it with our Kubernetes admin team. And truth be told, it took a couple of pitches to get traction and that's, that's perfectly fine. With everything new, a new solution, new approach, um, it takes a little bit of time to warm up to it. So some of the initial pushback has to do with security and risk concerns. And that's nothing specific to Flux multi-tenancy. I mean, that's just the nature of um, our process and our approach to every open source repository or publicly available Docker image. And then the next pushback had to do with some realignment of roles and responsibilities, which um, Flux multi-tenancy prescribed what I outlined down here, uh, which wasn't necessarily how we slice and dice the roles and responsibilities prior to Flux multi-tenancy. So let's just cover the three, right? Number one, our customer or our consumer, right? They're the ones running their applications in the namespace that they're given in that they're given. Next is the GitOps platform team, and that's us, the State Farm GitOps team. Our responsibility is to provide the automation so product teams can get their changes to production, factoring in developer experience while all the compliance are already built in. And last and certainly not the least is our Kubernetes admin team. They're the ones responsible for these ginormous fleet of clusters, patching, upgrades, and what we, we, we call them within here at State Farm, we call them the CAS team. Our internal Kubernetes offering is actually called CAS, Containers as a Service. So we will be referring to them as the CAS team from this point on. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Russ to finish up our multi-tenancy story. Thank you, May. So at this point, we're going to start diving into how we actually did this implementation. And we kind of, we broke it up into two phases. So kind of phase one, we wanted to take all of the new namespaces that were being created, and we wanted to create them using Flux. And then uh, kind of like part two, we wanted to take all of the existing namespaces that we had sitting in our prod environment and migrate those to also be managed by Flux. So we'll kind of take a look at that first part there is kind of creating those new namespaces. Now, we were actually fortunate enough that the CAS team had already created a automated namespace portal that was actually used for creating new namespaces for teams. Um, teams can come in, they can request what they want, and it was created automatically. The only thing that is behind the scenes, it was just using native API calls to set that up. So it was missing that kind of declarative um, nature that you want with Flux. So what we did is we basically injected this GitOps flow into that portal and it took out those API calls and instead put in kind of templating and customize to dynamically generate the YAML content. So we've got the exact same namespace and configurations that was called with those API calls, just now described as YAML files, and then took those files and then committed that back to that cluster config repo. This way, Flux would actually then at that point go through and create those new namespaces for us. On top of that, what we also did is with that, we injected or created with each new namespace, got its own namespace scoped Flux instance and Helm operator. This kind of helped give teams the tools they needed right off the bat that they already had Flux, they had the Helm operator, they could use this Flux instance to spin up additional Flux instances if need be, whatever the case may be, they had the tools already that they needed. Um, the most important part of this whole flow is that at the end of the day, the user interaction with that portal did not change. So what teams that were used to seeing, what teams had seen before, from a front end user perspective, there was no difference in how the namespaces were created. It was just on the back end where the, the, uh, the changes were made. So now we've got all of our new namespaces. They're all being, all of the namespaces are being created via Flux. We want to go back now, let's take all the pre-existing ones and migrate those into also be managed by Flux. And so kind of what we did for to kind of plan this out, as we first went through and we documented all of the namespaces that actually needed to be migrated. Because at this point, we had some that had already been created with Flux and we had quite a few that weren't. So just kind of wrote down all the different, um, or just documented which ones we needed. And then we went through it, each individual namespace and flagged those with special requirements. Things that had non-default resource quotas, non-default limit ranges, um, any namespaces that currently had Flux consumers in them. Um, things like that, and just anything that would need special cases when we were doing the migration, out of the, anything out of the default settings. Um, and through this, we decided to actually use a manual migration process. 
And I, I don't mean that we went through and created manual YAMLs for every single one of these namespaces. Um, what we did is we actually triggered off that the um, automation that we added to the namespace creation side. Um, we just triggered that with custom variables that had these special um, resource quota settings or limit rate settings, whatever the case may be. Um, so unfortunately, we couldn't do like a batch process of these namespace migration. We had to do each of them one by one, but at least the creation side of it was all done automated. Um, so we kind of got this all planned out. We think everything's set to go. We wanted to find a kind of like our rollout strategy. So the first thing we did is we actually migrated our own namespace first, our own GitOps team namespace. Um, as May likes to say, we ate our own dog food. We wanted to test out this plan. We wanted to make sure it worked. We wanted to make sure it wasn't going to cause any bugs. And if it did, we were in the position that at least we know what should have happened, how what could have gone wrong, whatever the case may be. It'd be easy for us to back it out and kind of see what um, and, and analyze what happened and fix the error. Um, luckily, that didn't happen. Everything worked as we expected. So we moved on to kind of phase two, which was our friends and family event, or if you were like a, like a beta or alpha test. And we have a few areas we work really closely with that um, were generous enough to volunteer to be part of this program that migrate theirs first. Because we know our namespace and how our stuff's configured worked just fine. These other areas might have had different customizations. They might have had different settings. We wanted to make sure it wasn't going to break anything that they had. Once we redeemed all that was successful, we went ahead and said, okay, now it's time to go through and do all of production. Now, May had mentioned earlier at this point, we still have well over 200 namespaces that we need to actually migrate. And to do this, we decided to kind of take an all hands approach, uh, meaning we had the entire GitOps team in, involved. Uh, we just felt like it was better to do it that way than to basically throw one member of the bus and say, go get them. Uh, we wanted to sit here and we just spread the wealth over everybody. I'm just, I think I speak for the entire GitOps team when I say this was not the most exciting part of this entire process. It, it was pretty tedious, in fact, but it was the right decision to kind of get this done as fast as possible. Um, what we did is we dedicated one week uh, with the whole team involvement. We actually were able to get this done in only two days. Um, and I'm not, excuse me, I marked on here that we were about 95% successful on the first attempt. Um, and what I mean is that we did have some errors that are usually triggered from like these manual trigger errors. Um, when you're ever doing any manual intervention, um, sometimes you fat fingered some things and typed in the wrong value. Sometimes we missed some resource quotas, things like that. Um, so we didn't get it right. You know, majority of it got right the first time and we were able to quickly fix the other ones um, shortly thereafter. And at the end, we kind of, this process covered 99% of our use cases. I'm gonna talk about that in the 1% here in just a little bit. Uh, but first, let's kind of talk about some of the lessons we learned. So for our current Flux consumers, we wanted to reuse the deploy keys to kind of not break any of the application deployments we had. And it didn't always work. And the weird thing was, is it actually worked until it didn't. And when we did the migration, everything worked as expected and everything was, was functioning correctly. And then uh, for the next day or so, we started seeing Flux sync errors. And it wasn't that it affected all of them. It just affected some, and then it affected a few more, and then it affected a few more after that. Um, we honestly don't know the root cause behind that. The best we can come up with is that something in the annotations kind of got messed up and caused Flux to create new keys. Um, but at this point, we were already done with the migration. So we didn't put a whole lot of time and effort into doing like a root cause analysis on what happened. And we focused more on what do we need to do to fix this um, so we don't break um, any of the remaining namespaces and get these current consumers working. Uh, we went back and did another all hands approach to just regenerate all new deploy keys. Um, at this point, we only had about 30 or 40 teams that were actually using Flux. Um, so that at least we didn't have to go through and do it for all 200. Um, we did an all hands approach on this and regenerating all that stuff took us about probably about an hour or so. Um, Another issue we ran across is a lesson learned is the double check your versions. Um, like I said, we added new Flux and Helm operator versions or instances to all these namespaces. We upgraded those all to the latest version. Um, and in our sandbox testing, our dev testing, even our prod friends and family event, we didn't have any errors. And sure enough, when we rolled up to prod, uh, we found some errors. Um, and there was uh, specifically, there was just a, a version change that broke one particular team with their Helm operator. It took us a while to find the error, but just kind of check on some of that. And I think they were using an older version and then just the newer version was just too big of a jump. Um, so that brings us to kind of like our next steps. And like I mentioned before, we, we kind of solved for 99%. And what we're looking at now is solutions for the 1%. Um, I mentioned before, Flux is specifically designed that namespace Flux is scoped to the namespace. So it cannot deploy outside of its own namespace for security reasons. 
um, that 1% needs that actual cross namespace deployment capabilities. Um, now, luckily, these teams are pretty smart. They actually have a temporary solution already in place. Um, what we're looking at now is we need to try to find a more permanent solution, not only for them, but also for any future use cases that might be needing this functionality as well. Um, and we're kind of hoping that that's going to kind of dig into this next point here um, as we are uh, actively looking into Flux V2 and getting ourselves um, familiar with the, all the different features that Flux V2 has to offer, kind of getting used to the new controller setups, getting used to the new um, uh, multi-tenancy configs, all this stuff. I'm trying to figure out like how that we're going to be able to fit that into our current structure, migrating our current stuff to be Flux V2, which seems to be a little bit more uh, like multi-tenant native, if you will. So with that, I will actually hand it back to May. All right, thanks Russ. To sum it up, the benefits that we reap from GitOps continues to permeate throughout our organization. We did not stop at application deployments. And because of, because of the introduction of Flux multi-tenancy, we've achieved increased transparency, right? If I go back to my use case earlier, if I have a change that I need to make into the namespace I was given, I am empowered to open up a merge request and get that change realized after it's been reviewed by after it's been reviewed by our CAS team. And it frees up our centralized CAS team to focus on other things because there's less reliance on them. Promotes self service. And last and certainly not the least, it's never too late to adopt GitOps. You may have caught this throughout our presentation. 2017 is when our on-prem Kubernetes platform became a thing. And we didn't introduce GitOps until two years after, January of 2019. In addition, you saw there's about 200 plus namespaces already before we even introduced Flux multi-tenancy and we got it done, right? GitOps, get, start using it, right? Um, and so I know you guys have lots of questions and we will see you guys in the Slack channel. Thank you all. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for that fantastic talk. And we actually are one minute early. So I did have a quick question if you're still there. Just double yes. Um, hey, May, and great to see you, May. Um, <clears throat> in fact, one, I'll use this to plug how you were one of our uh, companies that we worked with on a Flux migration workshop. So if anybody is looking to uh, go to the latest, greatest version of Flux, please make sure you go to our um, Slack channel for GitOps days. I post, I pinned a link there. I pinned a post with the link to fill out the form if you'd like to. And May uh, was one of the people who did. And it was really fun to like hear your questions and, and hear your migration experience. Um, and I, I guess I just wanted to follow up because you said you start with GitOps. And um, when we did this event last year, it, it was all about, you know, people who were excited about GitOps, but either felt that it would be too much of a, an ask from their teams. And the, our, a lot of our message was, you know, take baby steps. And like for you, like what what do you feel were the, the easiest baby steps to start with? And what kind of general guidance would you give when you're saying like, what's a good place to get started that might feel safe? and not too scary. I definitely recommend the, a similar approach, right? We started with application deployments and really having the same expectation afterwards, right? Here we are man, uh, recommending that you are to describe your target state via YAMLs. And then let's, let's be honest, the in immediate thing that they interface with with the cluster is not done the declarative way. And really at this point now, we've gotten everyone's on board. Like we gotta keep everything declarative, embrace that nature of Kubernetes. And everyone's excited about that. Russ, I know you can relate. Anything else to add? Uh, I would just say, don't be afraid of it. Just get in and start playing with it. Um, that's, the, that's the best way. I think that's what we did in the beginning was just got like a little sandbox environment to kind of start playing with that we couldn't really mess up too much <laughs> and, um, and just started playing around and see what it, what it can do. That's probably the easiest way. And then you realize that it might seem like a big task and scary in the beginning, but once you kind of get in and start playing with it and get, start to understand how it works, you realize it's actually not that bad. Awesome. Yeah. And um, I'm really glad that you both brought up the, the human component, right? That um, here you have two teams, um, uh, change is challenging, right? And being empathetic about that and, and communicative, that seemed like a, a great story to tell. So, and May, I, I've only met you a few times, but I really get the sense that you're very good at that. <laughs> oh, 
is it time to dance now? <laughs> <laughs> it's time to dance, exactly. And that's a perfect cue. Thank you, May. Um, yes, we, we really appreciate your talk. And now we have a, a lovely break with uh, DJ Desired State. So yeah, put on your dancing shoes, ask some questions in Slack, and we'll see you guys there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.